Hi, I'm Phil Albertelli, and this is the Week in Doubt, a podcast for atheists, agnostics, and whoever. This is episode 202, hmm, a numerical palindrome. Five things I like about religion. Actually, that title might be a bit of a misnomer or a little misleading, but hey, it sounds a little better or more concise than five things I like that are tangentially or superficially associated with organized religion. Not even a minute in and I'm already overanalyzing things. But before we jump in, I'd like to quickly take care of some housekeeping, or is it house cleaning? I can never remember how the uh, saying or phrase goes. But anyway, I wanted to apologize for a kind of quality control or technical issue that occurred last week. I played that clip from Sam Harris's interview with Glenn Lowry, and I think I accidentally applied this kind of annoying reverb effect to the track. So it sounds like Sam Harris is conducting the interview inside an empty school gymnasium, mea culpa. Also, I noticed that I got another like on the Facebook page. I looked through the notifications but couldn't find any new names. Maybe it was simply someone who liked the show before and then closed and later reactivated their Facebook account. It happens. But whoever you are, uh, thanks for liking the show again. Maybe. (laughs) But anyway, enough of that boring stuff. We have loftier things to discuss. So as I mentioned before, I've had this show idea on the back burner for a while now. I know I can be pretty critical of religion, and I thought it would be an upbeat change if I focused on some of the things I actually like about religion. But as I jokingly alluded at the top of the show, these are things that you don't have to be religious to enjoy. They're just things we often associate with religion or quote-unquote spirituality. And so these aren't necessarily in order of importance, but first up is the poetry of Rumi. Jaladin Rumi was a 13th century Sufi Muslim theologian, a mystic, and of course poet. I believe it was just in the episode before last where I discussed how Sam Harris also has an appreciation for the poetry of Rumi. Now, if you're not already aware, Sufism is a sect or strain of Islam that is considered relatively benign, shall we say, and uh, puts a heavy emphasis on things like mysticism, spiritual ecstasy, union with God, We've probably all seen images of whirling dervishes. That whirling is a kind of active meditation practiced by members of, uh, I think it's the Mev Levy order of Sufism. The idea is to lose yourself in the music and the whirling while focusing on God or union with God. And in its goal of trying to achieve the dissolution of the ego and achieve this kind of sense of oneness, It kind of reminds me a little bit of another relatively peaceful religion, namely Buddhism. And I say relatively as a preemptive measure in case anyone wants to point out some of the Buddhist violence that sometimes occurs in parts of South and Southeast Asia. And when I say uh, Sufism is uh, peaceful, uh, I do mean that, but obviously I'm not saying that all of Islam is peaceful. Obviously, as I've talked about ad nauseum on the show, uh, on the world stage right now, we obviously have a huge problem with uh, Islamic extremism. I was trying to remember when I first became aware of Rumi. It was a long time ago, before 9-11. I was already in my 20s when 9-11 occurred. Yeah, I know I'm old, but what are you going to do? If anyone's got a potion of eternal youth or a time machine, let me know. But anyway, yeah, the good old days before 9-11 when Islam for me was the poetry of Rumi and the music of Rabi Abu Khalil. Uh, My head was yet to be filled with horrific images of people jumping from towers and beheaded journalists. But reeling it in, uh, this is supposed to be an upbeat episode. So anyway, what is it that I like about the poetry of Rumi? Well, although nowadays when we think of Islam, freedom might not be the first word that comes to mind, but there is this spirit of freedom, openness, and wandering in the poetry of Rumi that I really like. In a weird way, it kind of reminds me of a similar feeling I get from some of the poetry of Jim Morrison. Uh, Yes, that Jim Morrison. Actually, there's a really short poem from Morrison's posthumous book, Wilderness. It's entitled Opening of the Trunk. 
The opening of the trunk, moment of inner freedom, when the mind is opened in the infinite universe revealed, and the soul is left to wander, dazed and confused, searching here and there for teachers and friends. That's actually the first poem in Wilderness, and uh, it's short, but I, th I think it's powerful. And something about the spirit of that poem kind of reminds me of uh, Rumi. Now, here's a Rumi poem I really like, entitled A Community of the Spirit. There is a community of the spirit. Join it and feel the delight of walking in the noisy street and being the noise. Drink all your passion and be a disgrace. Close both eyes to see with the other eye. Open your hands if you want to be held. Sit down in this circle. Quit acting like a wolf and feel the shepherd's love filling you. At night, your beloved wanders. Don't accept consolations. Close your mouth against food. Taste the lover's mouth in yours. You moan, she left me, he left me, twenty more will come. Be empty of worrying, think of who created thought. Why do you stay in prison when the door is so wide open? Move outside the tangle of fear thinking, live in silence, flow down and down in always widening rings of being. Yeah, so just great stuff. And if you're in over-analytical atheist mode, you might take exception or overanalyze some of the spiritual language. But um, if you just let yourself go and embrace the spirit of the poem, I, I think uh, it's probably one of the best poems I ever read. And I, I love the kind of spirit of, of freedom and wandering that it um, evokes in me. So now number two, the music of Hildegard von Bingen. Hildegard von Bingen, or Hildegard of Bingen, uh, born near the end of the 11th century, was a German Benedictine abbess, a Christian mystic, a theologian, a writer, and a musical composer. She was elected magistra by uh, her fellow nuns and even founded some monasteries. So quite an impressive and extensive resume. I think I first became aware of Hildegard von Bingen maybe back in my late teens or early 20s. Even though I had pretty much closed the door on belief in the Christian God by that age, I was still something of a seeker. Perhaps you could say I still am. And I was always exploring different religious and spiritual ideas. It was around this time that I started to really get into sacred music and what's known as early music. Pretty much the music of the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and sometimes even uh, the Baroque era. There was something really soothing and transporting about Hildegard's music. To this day, my favorite renditions of her musical pieces are those by an early music ensemble called Sequentia. They have an album entitled Canticles of Ecstasy that I uh, really, really like. And I've kind of a funny story, and, and I'm always managing to find my way into the gutter. Now, I, I don't know if iTunes still does it, but they used to censor explicit words in song and album titles. And I remember the Latin word, uh, cum, C-U-M, <laughs> used to be censored in the song titles of my Hildegard von Bingen tracks. For years, there was an asterisk where the U should be. In Latin, it's just an innocent preposition. Damn iTunes. But anyway, I think I'll play a little bit from Canticles of Ecstasy. And that's spiritual ecstasy, not sexual C asterisk M ecstasy. I might have to label this episode explicit. Didn't think this episode was going to take such a raunchy turn. But here it is. Fingers crossed I don't get another copyright strike. I just wanted you guys to be able to hear a little bit of the music for yourselves. All right, there it was. And even though I focused on Hildegard specifically, there's a ton of sacred music that I really enjoy. And if I gave each artist or ensemble their own place on the list, well, it would be a really long list. So three, well, I guess I'll go with art and architecture. So I have to admit that it wasn't until I went to school for design that I started to even develop 
any kind of appreciation for modern art. For most of my life, I've been naturally drawn towards classical and medieval slash renaissance art. You know, when you think about all the work, effort, discipline, and skill that must have gone into a Michelangelo sculpture, or Michelangelo, or a Botticelli painting, and then you look at a Jackson Pollock. Uh, you know, I have to admit, uh, though, after studying color theory and, you know, grids and layouts and things like that, I did start to warm up to Piet Mondrian, probably butchering his name, and all those little square and rectangular grid thingies he uh, painted. Yeah, but still I prefer the art of the ancient world and the Middle Ages and Renaissance. I'm especially drawn to anything weird and lurid, hellscapes and plague art, illuminated manuscripts with weird little creatures in the margins, saints with dog heads, etc. One of my favorite artists is Hieronymus Bosch. Everyone pronounces it like the power tool company. Uh, I think I once read it's supposed to be pronounced Boss. Like a boss. Uh, I don't know, though. So I just go with Bosch. He's probably most famous for his Garden of Earthly Delights triptych, with the first panel depicting Adam and Eve with God in the garden. The third panel is a depiction of hell. In the middle is, I don't know what, a ton of nude figures and weird animals. Uh, but it's great. Which takes me back to music again for a second. There's an ensemble I really like called La Nef, L-A space N-E-F. And they have an album entitled The Garden of Earthly Delights, inspired by the triptych. Good stuff. So yeah, there's a lot of religious art I like. Paintings, statuary, gothic cathedrals, stained glass, etc., etc. And why limit ourselves to the art of living religions? There's Stonehenge, Egyptian art and monuments, the artwork of the ancient Greeks and Romans that inspired the artists of the Renaissance. There's so much great art from around the ancient world, uh, Native American art as morbid and delightfully nightmarish as it can be sometimes, uh, the art of the Aztecs and Mayans, then the strange figures and elaborate knotted designs of the Celts and Norse. So much uh, great stuff. And speaking of architecture and religion, before I forget, Christopher Hitchens used to speak about his admiration for the Parthenon and, in fact, wrote a book calling for the reunification of the fractured edifice entitled The Parthenon Marbles. But Hitchens used his love of the Parthenon as an example of how you can have a strong fondness or affinity for things related to religion without actually being religious or believing in the tenets or dogma of that religion. The Parthenon is an absolutely amazing structure with its elaborate, figure-filled friezes, how's that for alliteration, and the skill and knowledge of geometry that must have been required in order to manipulate the sense of perspective achieved by the angles of the pillars, etc. And yet, as Hitchens pointed out, you don't have to believe in Athena to enjoy it. So next, and now we're getting deep, I'm gonna say sacred or primal awe. And this is something you don't need to be religious to experience. I think as long as your neurological equipment is intact, anyone can have one of those experiences where you feel a sense of oneness. And this takes us back to the whirling dervishes or Buddhist meditation, that dissolution of the ego where you feel plugged into or one with something greater than yourself. Joseph Campbell used to talk about getting in the quote-unquote zone, that mental space where everything just kind of falls into place and you're where you need to be. Um, Hitchens used to talk about being moved by art, landscape, music, etc. I remember watching a documentary a long time ago. It had something to do with spirituality or the origins of religion, something like that. And they were talking about cases of chimps or other primates supposedly experiencing what seemed to be some kind of primal awe. I think they showed footage of apes staring up at a rainbow in a waterfall or something to that effect. So I think there are these transcendent states we can access, states of oneness or quote-unquote spiritual ecstasy or euphoria. I myself have experienced these states just by, as corny as it might sound, being struck by the beauty of nature, the right light at the right time of day, leaves and flowers stirring in the breeze, etc., or the transcendent feeling that accompanies creative inspiration and of course, um, some powerful transcendent states can be achieved by, shall we say, chemical means. 
And I've been using the word transcendent. And whenever I do, I always feel the need to clarify what I'm talking about. Because I remember Christian apologist Douglas Wilson debating Hitch and calling Hitch out for using the word. He said something to the effect of, transcending what? If you only believe in the material, what are you transcending to? You'll hit your head on the ceiling, uh, figuratively speaking, or, or something like that. I think these experiences genuinely are transcending. But as a skeptic, I think it's merely transcending from one state of consciousness to another, not transcending from the mundane to some literally divine or deity-inspired state. I think most likely these phenomena have more to do with brain chemistry and neuroscience than they do with the divine. But that doesn't mean we should minimize their importance or profundity. But if you doubt just how much our conscious experience is manipulated on a chemical level, just think of all the things we ingest that affect mood and perception. Everything from caffeine to antidepressants to MDMA. So what does this have to do with religion? Well, as I insinuated when mentioning whirling dervishes and Buddhist meditation, I think these altered states have long been associated with religion, prayer, trance, meditation, spiritual ecstasy, etc., etc. But of course, to reiterate, you don't have to be religious to experience these things, not by any means. Okay, on to number five, mythology slash symbolism. Mythology, that's not religion. Those are just ancient stories, some people might be thinking. Yep, ancient stories about gods that people once believed in, probably at least as fervently as modern Christians or Muslims or whoever believe in their god. Now, I have to admit that I do like some biblical stories, too, as literature or on a symbolic level. But there's something about those ancient stories of these now-defunct pagan religions that really makes them resonate with me. On some level, I think I do simply enjoy them as entertainment. There's something captivating about the exotic and fanciful, dreamlike nature of these stories. But I think it also has something to do with the nature of polytheistic religions. Instead of one crusty old deity, we have a whole vibrant pantheon. And I think it's as if the different aspects of life, the natural world or forces of nature, and, and human nature are spread throughout the pantheon and embodied in these different gods, making for very interesting storytelling. And even if we can't always put our finger on it, I think these stories do resonate with us and tell us something about ourselves. I'm sure a lot of you out there already know who Joseph Campbell is, but if you don't and you're interested in mythology, check out the epic interview series with Campbell conducted by PBS's Bill Moyers entitled The Power of Myth. It's old and it's long, but I think it's something everyone should see. I believe you can find it on YouTube unless it got yanked. That was supposed to be the last one, but I just thought of another thing associated with religion that I like. Holidays. Who doesn't love holidays? Well, I shouldn't say that. I think there are some people who have trouble with uh, the holidays, especially those big family ones you know, like Thanksgiving and Christmas. But me, hey, any excuse to consider a day special. I have no interest in sports, and I even feel a sense of magic in the air when Super Bowl Sunday rolls around. I think there's a lot of people who are basically secular and only culturally or nominally religious who nevertheless love the holidays and view them as times of celebration, times to get together with family and friends, or just a much-needed break from the day-in, day-out, nine-to-five grind. And I was just talking about mythology. Let's not forget the pagan roots or trappings of some of these big holidays like Christmas, Easter, and Halloween. Now, these pagan associations often make hardcore fundamentalist Christians wary of the holidays, but it makes me love them all the more. Halloween, or All Hallows' Eve, is basically the Christianization of the Celtic New Year, Samhain, spelled Samhain, a time of year when it was thought that the wall or barrier separating the living and the dead fell down or grew thin, allowing the dead to cross into our world or 
vice versa. December 25th was associated with the pagan god Mithras or Mithra, possibly either his birthday or at least a Mithraic feast day. There's also the influence of Roman Saturnalia and then all those Norse slash Germanic uh, pagan elements like Yule logs and evergreen trees. And Easter, its very name is derived from that of a German fertility goddess, or so it's thought, and it's chock full of fertility symbols, bunnies and eggs, etc. Pretty cool, right? But I guess with that, I'm going to call it quits. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I had a lot of fun making it. You guys know the drill. You can like the Facebook page, uh, follow the show on Twitter, check out the YouTube channel. Maybe you're doing that now. Subscribe to the show or rate the show through iTunes. If you want to help the show out monetarily, you can do so by using the PayPal widget at the bottom of the Podbean page. There's all that alliteration. Uh, or you can go to patreon.com slash the week in doubt and pledge as little as 99 cents a month to help the show out and quit anytime you want. And I know I haven't done much for the Patreon listeners recently. What I'm thinking about doing is taking that version of H.P. Lovecraft's The Tomb, that reading that I did, slapping that on YouTube and replacing it with a new uh, Lovecraft story, which will be available through Patreon only um, until I eventually decide to, you know, replace that one. And I'm I'm not sure which story I'll do. I might do uh, the thing on the doorstep, or uh, there's, or maybe the outsider. But uh, we'll see, and hopefully that will happen soon. But uh, all right, guys. Once again, uh, thanks for listening, and until next week. <laughs> <laughs>